thank you for being here and um, thank the two rabbis for their comments and thank you, uh, Mayor Weber, for your comments. We're going to be talking about the Jewish Kulturbund in mainly in Berlin between 1933 and its demise in 1939. But let's go back a little bit into the Weimar Republic. Arthur Landsberger uh, wrote a satire. He was a, a very well-read novelist, um, especially in the 1920s. And he was born in 1876. He died in 1933 by suicide as he was being chased by the Gestapo. Um, like, like I said, he was a widely read fiction writer. And his 1925 satire, Berlin on a Juden, Berlin without Jews, um, gives this scenario. Remember, this is 1925. After its overwhelming victory, the Nationalverband, the sort of what he was calling the, his fictional Nazis, they pass a law forcing all Jews to leave the country. For the time during which the Jews are expelled, the Nationalverband propaganda office is planning a huge festivity called Germany Liberated. In this situation, here's a dialogue that happens between two of the people planning the festival. Go look for a popular composer and tell him to compose a march for us. Germany liberated, and each and every orchestra in the theaters, opera, cinemas, and restaurants will be forced to play it a dozen times every evening. To the sound and the singing of this march, the Jews will be expelled. Well, th that won't be easy. Why is that? The composer shouldn't be from the opera, but someone who really knows the sound the German nature responds to. So everyone who ever hears this melody can sing along right away. Take Gilbert, for example. Well, I'll talk to him, but um, Gilbert's name is Winterfeld, and he's a Jew himself. Well, that doesn't work. Then get Lehar. Well, the guy who wrote The Merry Widow, he knows how to compose the way the Germans like it. Well, he's also a Jew. That's disgusting. Who else can we get? You know the names. There are dozens. Oskar Strauss, Benatsky, Jaap Kohl, Winterberg, uh, Rudolf Nelson, Kolo, Hirsch. Well, Hirsch is impossible. He's Jewish. But what about Nelson? Well, Rudolf Nelson, who was a great composer and pianist, his name was actually Levinson. Uh, Stop it, says the, the, the leader of this group. Um, all that I mention are Jews. Well, the only person left is Richard Strauss. He signed the appeal against the new law, so we can't have him do it. Well, what about Siegfried Wagner? He would do it, and he's also a member of the Nationalverband. Well, my lord, do you honestly think there's one person of our people who could sing along to a tune composed by Siegfried Wagner? No, I don't think so. So what are you going to do? Well, I'll be forced to hire a Jew. So that's satire, 1925. Hitler was appointed the Reich's Chancellor on January 30th of 1933. Many people thought it was just a temporary failure of the system. And many fled, many Jews and non-Jews fled, mainly socialist, communists, and uh, artistic types. But at the very end of December of 1932, in December, the Central Association of German Citizens of the Jewish Faith wrote in their New Year's letter, we greet the new year 1933, in which the number three appears twice for luck, confident that for Germany and for the world, and for German Jews also, it will be a year of progress. By January 31st of 1933, the day after Hitler took office, the Jewish newspaper, the Yiddische Rundschau, wrote, as Jews, we are facing the fact that government power in Germany has now been assumed by forces hostile to us. So there's a scene of the main Jewish merchant street in Berlin in 1921 and one of the record and bookstores on that street. In 1933, there were about 525,000 Jews in Germany. It was three quarters of 1% of the population of Germany. Um, about 38,000 left immediately, mostly politically active uh, Jews, but most stayed 
They thought they were relatively free. Of course, there was Moses Mendelssohn and Heine, and there was a lot of intermarriage. They were Germans first and Jews second. About 70% of the Jews in Germany lived in urban areas, with about 50% living in the 10 largest German cities. The largest population, of course, was in Berlin. There were about 160,000, which represented less than 4% of the city's entire population. Other large population centers included Frankfurt, about 26,000 Jews, Breslau, about 20,000, Hamburg, about 17,000, Cologne, 15,000, Hanover, about 13,000, and Leipzig, about 12,000. About one in five Jews still lived in small towns around Germany. Getting started quickly, on the 1st of April of 1933, there was a methodical boycott of Jewish goods, doctors, and lawyers, and merchants. Six days later, in April, on April 7th of 1933, all non-Aryans were eliminated from civil service. That included musicians playing in symphony orchestras. And by November 1st of 1933, the Reich's Ch uh, Chamber of Culture um, considered Jews unreliable or unsuitable and denied acceptance. You had to be a member of the chamber in order to have a job. So this brings us to what happened to these musicians, artists, actors, when they were kicked out of their jobs in universities and in major orchestras. Kurt Zinger was born in 1885 in West Prussia. He grew up in Koblenz. His father was a rabbi. He studied medicine and musicology. He worked as a neurologist for part of the time. And in 1912, he combined those by being director of the Berlin Doctors' Choir. In 1927, he became the deputy director of the Charlottenburg Opera, the uh, Stetzoper in Berlin. Singer said at the time that in the, those days at the beginning of April, when we Jews feared the severe loss of freedom of movement that we were used to, the young director Kurt Baumann came to me with a plan for establishing a theater and membership organization. I had worked out a similar plan and submitted it both to Rabbi Dr. Leo Beck uh, as a competent judge. After getting his recommendation, I consulted the leading men from Jewish organizations. One committee formulated the Constitution, another committee made arrangements for publicity evenings, a third prepared them for the artistic point of view. I submitted the official applications for a license for a Kulturbund Deutscher Juden, a, a cultural organization for German Jews, to various government authorities. The decision about the license was delegated by the Minister President of Prussia to the Ministry of Education, within which, within which the President of the Prussian Theater Commission, who was Staatskommissar Hans Hinkel, or his deputy, was to lead the negotiations. Simultaneously, I gave reports to the Chief of Police and to the Ministry of Propaganda. Plans for the cultural center were supported by leading representatives of Jewish cultural life, and the board of honorary chairmen included Leo Beck, Martin Buber, Arthur Elliser, Leonid Kreutzer, Max Liebermann, and others. Kurt Baumann, who Zinger was just referring to, was a theater director, and he recalls about very similarly from the very beginning, it was clear to me that the time, for the time being, it was still doubtful whether and how official permission could be obtained. I was also aware that Zionist circles would only lend their support if we conducted all our cultural activities in Yiddish or Hebrew. From the majority, it was gathered around the Central Association of German Citizens of the Jewish Faith. I could expect that a call for a purely Jewish cultural league cultural league would be met with the response, we're not going voluntarily into the ghetto. In any event, it was clear to me that there must be a detailed plan with a budget, artistic and intellectual staff, and a members organization in order to prove that such an idea could be carried out. So I sat down and in about two weeks drafted a plan set out in the minutest detail. The next thing to consider was who was to be the head of such an enterprise. It was not long before I thought of my mentor, Dr. Kurt Zinger, the theater manager of the Städtische Oper. So I went to see him and told him about the general idea and asked him to examine my plan more closely and in the greatest confidentiality. 
He was immediately interested and said that similar ideas had also been going through his head, but that he had not pursued the matter. After a short while, Dr. Zinger ran, rang and invited me to visit him to discuss the plan. We then began to work together intensively on a daily basis, and during the course of this, several revisions were made to the plan. Dr. Zinger had adopted the idea with enthusiasm and declared himself prepared to head the organization in the event we succeeded. As I mentioned, this went to a um, German official named Heinz, uh, Hans Heinrich Hinkel. Hinkel said just before the musicians and professors were fired from their university jobs. This quote is from the 6th of April of 1933. We know that Jewish intellectual hegemony in Germany ultimately meant that we Germans lost all control over our home, especially as regards culture and politics. Of course, the freelance German Jewish, a Jewish German artist shall be free to pursue his activities provided he subordinates himself utterly to the duties of a German citizen, by which naturally I mean a citizen of our new state. Especially as regards cultural matters, we Germans shall be in charge insofar as permanent positions of state employment are concerned, and we shall defend this by each and every means. For the rest, I would point out that as freelance workers, even Jewish artists will in future always have the opportunity to make their mark commensurate with their personal achievements. Hinkel was born in 1901 in Worms. He was the head of the theater committee of the Nazi party. He studied political science and philosophy in Bonn, then went to Munich and joined the Nazi party in 1921. Uh, he worked for party newspapers and was a member of the Berlin City Council. And on the 15th of July of 1933, a letter from Hinkel to Zinger and Baumann established the Jüdische Kulturbund. The arrangement was that only Jews were allowed to participate as performers or as audience. Programs needed permission. There could be no sale of tickets, but only a membership organization and ads for performances could only appear in Jewish publications. There's a membership card. And um, this is an early membership card. Uh, you can see it says Kulturbund Deutscher Juden. At one point in the life of the Kulturbund, the Nazis decided that you could not have German Jews. And they required the name to be changed to the Jüdischer Kulturbund. So this is a very early card. Some people, like Singer thought, saw this as a collaboration. But Singer said, it's not a ghetto organization, but it'll be so good that the Germans will be ashamed of themselves for making us do this. The Kulturbund served Hinkel's purposes, and it served his purposes to protect the Kultur Kulturbund as much as possible. So they finalized the membership fees and the Nazis estimated, like I said earlier, about 178,000 Berliners were Jewish. By October of 1933, 12,500 were members of the Kulturbund, and by winter, it had grown to 20,000. The first concert of the Kulturbund was on the 22nd of May of 1933, when Kurt Zinger conducted the choir and orchestra in arias and choruses from Handel's Judas Maccabeus, and also choral music by Schubert and Haydn. There's a photograph of the dress rehearsal, and there's the actual concert. The first opera of the Kulturbund was performed in um, November of 1930. I had 1934 on the slide. It should have been 33. Um, first performed in, 19 th in November of 33 was The Marriage of Figaro, which was also directed by Kurt Zinger. But what happened as the musicians were working on this along the way, by 1935, no especially German works were allowed. You have to remember that Nazi leaders used culture as part of their propaganda, and many of them were failed artists themselves. You know, Hitler, a painter and a passionate Wagnerian, Goebbels, a would-be novelist and playwright, Goering, a gluttonous art collector, uh, Rosenberg was a trained architect. 
They raised culture to a central position in the so-called new order and used the arts as a means of gaining legitimacy, respectability, and acceptability. By 1935, uh, official lists were promulgated with the names of unacceptable composers and forbidden compositions. That was throughout Germany. Um, and of course, the centerpiece of Nazi policy in the field of music was, of course, brute anti-Semitism, and this was implemented immediately and ruthlessly. Germans of Jewish background accounted for only 2% of music professionals in 1933, although it included some of the country's leading musicians, such as Bruno Walter, Otto Klemperer, Leo Blech, Arnold Schoenberg, Kurt Weil, Hans Eisler, Jascha Hornstein, etc. Within weeks of the Nazi takeover, they and many non-Jews who were anti-Nazi were discharged along with singers, teachers, administrators, and soloists such as Arthur Schnabel and Rudolf Serkin. This book, which contained many, many falsehoods, um, for example, it said that uh, Max Bruch, who was a good German Lutheran, said that he was Jewish because he wrote a Kol Nidre. <laughs> um, it, it told people out in the provinces what music could or could not be performed and what musicians were possibly Jewish and therefore should not be engaged. The author of this book, um, Herbert Gerick, was born in 1905 and died in 1996. He was a musicologist, and of course his most famous work is what we just saw, the lexicon of uh, Jews in music. He became an ardent Nazi in 1932, joined the SA in 1933, and the SS in 1935. Um, in 1935, he began a position for the Reich as head of the music section for the monitoring of the intellectual and ideological training and education of the Nazi party. He took over planning of the music policy of Alfred Rosenberg and was responsible for removing Jews from their positions and stopping the spread of avant-garde music. During the war itself, he took a leading role in stealing cultural property in the occupied countries and sending it back to Germany. In occupied France alone, Garrick's uh, troops, thugs, whatever you want to call them, carried out thefts in, over, in two years from 34,000 Jewish homes or apartments, including those of the great operatic composer Emmerich Kalman, the composer Darius Mio, and the cellist Gregor Piatigorsky. After the war, he worked as a music critic in Dortmund, and in 1954 wrote a lexicon of music, which very uh, strangely was published by the same publisher who had published the Nazi lexicon. So as we move along, in 1936, Wagner and Schiller were banned from the Kulturbund. In 1937, no Beethoven. In 1938, after the Anschluss, Mozart was forbidden. It was still allowed to um, do Handel's music in English, the English oratorios, and some Gluck, and that was okay until Kristallnacht in 1938. Um, the finances were difficult, uh, especially by the spring of 1937, but the Kulturbund was still giving about 50 events per month in Berlin alone. And there were cultural centers, Kulturbund centers set up in Frankfurt where they had a major symphony orchestra. Uh, there were three theater ensembles, Berlin, Hamburg, and Cologne, an opera in Berlin, the orchestras of Berlin and Frankfurt, one cabaret stage, a school theater, some choirs, and ensembles which totaled about 2,500 artists made a modest living. Um, until 1938, Nearly 600 artists and almost the same number of support staff, plus 300 artisans, mechanics, and additional assistants were primarily engaged for the Jewish cult cultural centers in Germany, and it was the greatest single factor in providing work for Jewish people in Germany under Nazi rule before the war started. Almost 70,000 people in the 100 towns attended Kulturbund performances regularly. And so it, it's a very important um, operation. And there were recordings. And this is what's so remarkable. Some of these recordings were made in the basement of synagogues. And um, 
as we go to the recordings. This, this particular concert by Chem Yovinever was of Jewish music. He was a great musicologist of especially um, Eastern Jewish music. And his anthology of Jewish music was published, uh, and it's a major uh, textbook and collection of, of melodies uh, that uh, it was, it's a remarkable volume. So there he is conducting um, at the synagogue. There's a program from the Kulturbund Orchestra in Frankfurt. Um, William Steinberg came to the United States, was music director of the Pittsburgh Symphony and the Boston Symphony. Um, very fine conductor. And uh, here he is with the Kulturbund in 1936. As I mentioned, there were recordings. And there were two types of recordings. So there were some original recordings recorded in the theaters or in basements of synagogues and, and um, facilities, and some reissues of recordings made by the important German recording companies, such as Lindstrom Gesellschaft, the Deutsche Grammophon Gesellschaft, and Telefunken. When the Nazi racial laws went into place, any, Germ any Jewish director on the boards of these companies were replaced immediately. In about 1933 through about 1937, there were two small record companies in Berlin who were devoted to Jewish music. Hirsch Levin's um, Hebrew bookstore created a label called Zemer, which is Hebrew for song, and he eventually got out of Germany, went to Israel, and was a pioneer in the record business in Israel. And then Moritz Levin and his special radio house of Lucra created the Lucrafon label. They were not related. Here's Levin, and there he is. Um, he was um, from Vilna in Lithuania. He was an Orthodox rabbi. His uh, Zemmer records uh, post published mostly um, Kulturbund artists and was very uh, big with Yiddish and cantorial recordings. Uh, the other record company, uh, there's the Zemmer, there's an ad for Zemmer records. And, and then here's an ad for Lucrophone. And you can see he says, uh, Jewish artists on Lucrophone, Hebrew, Yiddish, and cantorial recordings. That was done by Moritz Levin, who was a reform Berlin native. And he was a businessman. He did Zionist classical cabaret music, Yiddish, South American, and pop. A lot of his recordings wound up going to the um, early settlements in Tel Aviv and were distributed in Palestine um, before the war. Uh, Lucrophon was sort of the de facto Kulturbund label with some orchestra, chorus, and dance band recordings, but also they issued some old um, records made by the major German recording companies. There's one with Josef Schmidt, the great tenor. And it's with Josef Schmidt that we'll begin our musical examples now. So let's go back to Mr. Schmidt. There's Josef Schmidt's passport. Um, he was born in Romania. He came to Germany to study and to be a singer. He was born in 1904. Um, he studied in Vienna and Berlin. He had a wonderful voice for radio. He didn't do much live opera. In fact, he did virtually no live opera because he was about five foot one. And um, in his, he made a number of movies. Uh, uh, the um, My Song Goes Around the World from May of 1933. Uh, that was thrown into the book burnings. It was a 1931 film that was very popular throughout Germany and German-speaking world. Um, he made over 100 recordings that were part of the German, the Berlin Reform Choir, made a com very complete set of liturgical recordings in 1929. And in some cases, in small reform congregations, they were used instead of a cantor and choir. They were played during the services. And um, they were reissued about 25 years ago um, as on pretty decent CDs, and we're going to hear some of that. But um, Josef Schmidt was also um, a cantor in the Eastern European tradition, and we're going to start by hearing him singing Anna Avda de Kucha Brihu um, from the part of the Shahrit service just before. Uh, the Torah is taken out. 
And this is a private recording made for the Kulturbund in 1934. The sound is not very good. You have the idea of what he could do as a traditional Eastern European Orthodox Khazan. But as I said, he was part of this incredible series of recordings for the Berlin Reform Society. And one of them, one of the recordings was of um, Louis Lewandowski's Deutsche Kedusha, a remarkably complex piece of music. Uh, the basic Kedusha theme, but mostly in German with Hebrew um, for Kadosh, 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 and for the Shema, and for a couple of other single lines. But everything else is in German with a very, very church-like organ introduction. And here you can hear Josef Schmidt as a singer of Jewish music of a totally different tradition. get the idea. It's, it goes on for another six or seven minutes. Um, you heard the kadosh, kadosh, kadosh in Hebrew or the rest in German, but that's a remarkable voice. He was 28 years old when that recording was made. Um, Josef Schmidt had an unfortunate life. Uh, he went on a tour to Antwerp, to uh, Palestine and back to Antwerp. 1935-37, he came back to Berlin for uh, Kulturbund concerts. And then he went to France, and after the occupation of France, he went to Switzerland and was arrested at the Swiss border and put in a camp um, you know, for uh, illegal aliens um, near Zurich and died of heart failure at the age of 38 in November of 1942. So, one more recording of his as an opera singer. <laughs> This was recorded about 1931. <laughs> Sembra. 
We could go on forever with Josef Schmidt recordings, but there's not time for that. There were also orchestral recordings, and we'll go past these. There's one of the orchestras of the Kulturbund, and they made a series of recordings as well. And um, we're going to hear one movement of the um, rondo from Mozart's um, Serenade Number no. 6 for two string orchestras in D major, the Serenata Noturna. And this is the Kulturbund with Josef Rosenstock conducting. And it's a little scrappy, but it was made under dire conditions in 1935. <laughs> Josef Rosenstock was conductor of one of the orchestras. Rudolf Schwarz was the head of music for the Kulturbund and was also a conductor. Um, Schwarz was able to get out, both Rosenstock and Schwarz got out of Germany. Uh, Schwarz moved to England where he became music director of the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, was an early pioneer in uh, making recording of Gustav Mahler. His, um, late 50s recording of Mahler's Fifth Symphony it was with the London Symphony Orchestra is still uh, considered very fine. And um, he became a very important part of British musical life in the 1950s, uh, up until his, really up through, his, through the time of uh, his retirement in the 80s. And here he is conducting um, a performance of Mahler's Second Symphony. Of course, Mahler's music was, uh, was banned there were also choruses as part of the Kulturbund, and this recording was made in 1935 before Beethoven was taken off the table for them. It's Beethoven's The Era Gottes aus der Natur. But here's the Kulturbund madrigal singers. <laughs> And during that recording session, they also recorded some Schubert, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But part of what was happening in the Kulturbund is that artists who thought of themselves primarily as German started working with material that they thought of as being for the East European Jews, not for their Berliner compatriots. And so there were quite a few recordings of Jewish dances um, set by various arrangements Here's one, um, a very traditional one, with the Kulturbund Orchestra. traditional Eastern European sounding Jewish dances that as part of the Berlin Jewish culture wouldn't have been heard before. Now some composers decided to take the arrangements more um, into their own hands and Karl Rathaus also wrote a suite of Jewish dances. He got out of Germany, he went to um, New York and beginning in um, 1940 was a major professor of composition at Queens College in New York. And here's a bit of one of his Jewish dance arrangements. <laughs> You can 
tell that this arrangement is more of a composition based on Jewish dances rather than just an arrangement of the dance. Both of those Jewish dance recordings were made in the uh, Kulturbund Theater in 1935. So the Madrigal Singers, um, in that same recording session in 1935 where you heard the Beethoven, also recorded Schubert's Psalm 92. Um, and Schubert wrote this in Hebrew. He was a friend of Solomon Zulzer, the famous Vienna Jewish musician who created a lot of the tunes that we know now and think of as being traditional tunes came from the pen of Zulzer in the early 19th century. So um, we have um, this Psalm Tov Lahodos. There's the music, it's originally written in Hebrew. And here's the Kulturbund Madrigal singers singing this. It's based on some tunes that Zulzer shared with Schubert. And of course, by 1938, Schubert was off the table for the Kulturbund. In addition, of course, there were more cantorial recordings and recordings of Yiddish songs. And um, Edgar Alexander, who we'll hear in just a moment, was born in 1903 in Silesia went to Berlin in 1920. He was a star of cabarets. He was in the premiere of Kurt Weill's um, um, Mahagoni. Um, he went to Cuba in 1938 and uh, went to New York in 1940 and became a cantor in New York and died in 1975. And here he is singing the Yiddish song uh, Der Rebbe Elimelech, um, who calls for his fiddlers and his cymbal players and his drummers. And um, it's a rather exciting recording with the uh, orchestra called Sid Kay's Fellows, led by um, Shabtai or Zygmunt Petrushka, who was a trumpet player who then went to uh, Israel in the, th in the 30s, and uh, recorded in the basement of a synagogue in 1936. <laughs> Der Rebbe Elimelach ist geworden sehr freilach, ist geworden sehr freilach, Elimelach. Und er ausgetun die Zwillen und hat euch gewischt die Brillen und geschickt nach die Fiedler die Zwei. Und als die Fiedel, die Gefiedler, haben Fiedel, die Gefiedel, haben Fiedel, die Gefiedel, haben Zwei. The symbol is not symbols to crash, but the symbolum, the string hammer dulcimer. So we're now going to hear some pop music that the Kulturbund recorded. These are from 1935 and 36. All of them recorded in the basement of one of the synagogues in Berlin. And we'll hear one song um, with Dora Gerson, and we'll see her photo on here. She was 
Um, she, her life ended in Auschwitz. Um, a song called uh, Bachbord und Steuerbord, you know, port and starboard. And um, she sang ports on the left and starboards on the right, and the grog has some really good rum in it. <laughs> um, then Willy Rosen, who was a very popular um, cabaret star and pianist, um, his Dort in Hawaii, that's where I lost my heart. And um, Rosen was um, sent to Terezin and then to Auschwitz and was murdered in 1944. Following that, uh, the dance band Sid Kay's Fellows, again recorded in the basement of a synagogue, La Cucaracha in Spanish, with Ferris Gondoski doing the vocals. And um, also, the, um, after Dorton Hawaii, before Cucaracha, Dor Dora Gerson sings again, uh, Yoshka Yoshka, or where the song where the rabbi says, um, have a great time and drink whiskey and not wine. And um, after Kukaracha, some Hebrew folk songs that were done for the Chalutzim in Palestine. <laughs> Ein Schiffjunge darf niemals seekrank nicht sein, der schwimmt überm Rehling in Ozean rein. Fliegt von einer Eck in die andere Eck, rollt vom Vorderdeck nach dem Achterdeck und riecht in die Koje hinein. Wachwort ist links und Türwort ist rechts, Zeit ist der Groß von Rum. Türwort ist rechts und Wachwort ist links.
Well, just a little sample of the pop music, Yiddish, Hebrew, Spanish, and German, uh, that the Kulturbund recorded for the um, enjoyment of the Jewish population of Germany and in the um, beginnings of Israel. So Israeli tunes, or what we now think of as Israeli dance tunes, were popular. Here's an arrangement by the Krushka, the same tune we just heard, but as a dance band. And that's a medley of horrors that goes on for about five or six minutes. Now we're going to get to uh, one of the few films made by the Kulturbund, and this will be the end of the presentation. Um, there were two Zionist films done by the Kulturbund. Uh, this one is Shir Ivri, a Hebrew song. Um, it was shot in the old town of Jerusalem in 1934 and 35. The music was added in March of 1935 in Berlin. The Kulturbund Orchestra was conducted by Josef Rosenstock, and Andreas Weisgerber was the um, violinist. And as you can see from, the, from this uh, ad, the orchestra of Lucrophon was conducted by Kurt Zanderling. Um, I had the deepest pleasure of um, working with Kurt Zanderling in the early 90s. He was one of those Jewish musicians who didn't come west. His easiest escape from Germany was to go east, and he went to Moscow and became one of the two main conductors, along with Yevgeny Mravinsky of the Leningrad Philharmonic. Uh, he made many recordings in the Soviet Union, and at the fall of the Soviet Union in the 80s, he started coming west more. Remarkable conductor, and his ill health uh, forced him not to uh, travel as much as we all wanted him to travel. Um, he was uh, conducted the Chicago Symphony a number of times, some very memorable performances there. And um, he is, on this set, he's, record, he's recorded the Hebrew melody by Achron. And that's the major piece on this film. And if we can go to the film now, that would be perfect.
So that's one of the two films. Fortunately, it was uh, re totally restored about 20 years ago. So I hope in this time that we've had, we've gotten a little bit of a very, very shallow um, look into the Jewish Kulturbund, what they did, how they were formed, and some of the musicians and performances that were part of the Kulturbund in those years from the time the Nazis took power until the beginning of World War II.